The key verse that is guiding our study this weekend is Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. This chapter is speaking about the beast, which is another symbol for the little horn. This system is also called the abomination of desolation. It's called the man of sin, the king of the north, the antichrist, the harlot of Revelation 17. There are many names given to this system. The beast of Revelation 13 represents the Roman Catholic papacy. Now let me explain that when we say the papacy we're not talking about the members of the Roman Catholic Church. There are many sincere loving Christians in the Roman Catholic Church. We are talking about the system. The papacy is a union of church and state. And so we're not referring to the individuals in the church, we're referring to the system. That's what the beast of Revelation 13 represents. And last evening we were speaking about how history moves from a thesis to an antithesis to a synthesis. And we applied this concept of history to a particular segment of human history. We noticed that during the 1260 years of papal dominance from 538 to 1798, the papacy basically ruled over the civil powers of Europe. In other words, the papacy dictated and the civil powers did what the papacy wanted them to do. But then you have the rise of the antithesis to this, which is composed of two stages. The first reaction against the papacy was the Protestant Reformation. The date 1517 is usually given for the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, although you have uh, others, Wycliffe and, and Huss and others that came before this. So the first reaction against the papacy major was the Protestant Reformation. And then at the end of the 1260 years, from 1793 to 1798, you have the French Revolution, where the civil powers of the world, beginning with France, rose and gave the papacy its deadly wound. In other words, the civil powers of the world withdrew their support from the papacy. And so you have the action, and then you have the reaction, and then at the end we will have the synthesis. What does that mean? It means that the contradictory sides are going to come together. In other words, Protestantism, Romanism, and the civil powers of the world will all merge together. They will synthesize, in other words, or come together. Ellen White referred to this in great controversy with words, and I paraphrase, she states, Papists, Protestants and worldlings. How many in, in uh, the final conflict? How many? Three. Papists, Protestants and worldlings will see in this movement, together, a means to convert the world and to introduce the long-awaited millennium of peace on earth. That's the way Ellen White describes it in the book Great Controversy. And we are seeing in our world today a synthesis of the papacy, apostate Protestantism, and the socialist, globalist, secular powers of the world. Now, I would like to read, as we enter new territory this morning, some statements from the Roman Catholic papacy where they use certain catchwords and expressions that indicate how the papacy has embraced socialism. There are several words and phrases that show that the papacy has basically embraced socialism. I would even go so far as to say communism. The first of those expression, expressions is the common good. Have you noticed that? The common good. What does that mean? It means that individualism is out. 
and it means that free enterprise is also out. Everything needs to be done according to the papacy for the common good, in other words, for the global good. I read a couple of statements from Roman Catholic sources. The first is from the Compendium of Catholic Social Doctrine. I have an entire copy of this. It takes more than one whole ream of paper to see what the social doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church is officially uh, today. In section 167 of this compendium, we find the following words. The common good, therefore, involves all members of society. No one is exempt from cooperating according to each person's possibilities in attaining and developing it, that is, the common good. Pope Francis, in his encyclical Laudato Si, paragraph 169, explained, international negotiations, that is, negotiations between different nations, cannot make significant progress. In other words, negotiations among nations can't make progress. What is the reason why they can't make progress? He explains, due to positions taken by countries, like the USA, for example, right now, so once again, due to positions taken by countries which place their national interests above the global common good. Are you understanding what this is saying? Individual countries cannot focus on their own interests. They have to focus on the global common good. Nationalism is out. Individualism is out. Globalism is in. Another expression or word that is used by the papacy these days, which is a socialist word, is the word solidarity. What does solidarity mean? It means that everyone on earth must cooperate together for the common good. Because we are all members of a, of a common humanity. And we must all come together and cooperate. We must all have solidarity. Let me read you a couple of statements from Roman Catholic sources. Actually from the Pope's uh, encyclical on the environment, Laudato Si. Once again, in this particular uh, encyclical, the Pope constantly rails without mentioning the name. He rails against the system that exists in the United States, capitalism, because this is a socialist document. Even conservatives within the Roman Catholic Communion are disgusted with the Pope, with the present Pope because he has embraced socialism and he's forgotten Roman Catholic doctrine and the authority of the papal chair. So this is what he wrote on, in paragraph 14. Obstructionist attitudes, like the one of the United States right now, like withdrawing from the Paris Climate Agreement, that's obstruction in the minds of the Pope. Obstructionist attitudes, even on the part of believers, can range from denial of the problem that is of climate change to indifference, nonchalant resignation, or blind confidence in technical solutions. And then he wrote, we require a new and universal solidarity. In other words, no obstructions. We need a universal solidarity. In paragraph 201, he wrote, The majority of people living on our planet profess to be believers. This should spur religions to dialogue among themselves for the sake of protecting nature, defending the poor, and building networks of respect and fraternity. Solidarity, a common word in the socialist view that the present papacy has. Another word that appears quite frequently in papal literature is the word subsidiarity. 
What does subsidiarity mean? It means that our personal individual interests are subsidiary to the common good. It means that the interests of individual states or nations are subsidiary to the interests of the common good. Constantly you find the word subsidiarity. Our individual uh, desires and our national desires are subsidiary to the global aims and the global good. The final expression that I would like to refer to is called the common destination of goods. What is meant by the common destination of goods? Basically what this means is that property is not necessarily personal, but belongs to all humanity according to need. Let me read from the compendium of Catholic social doctrine about what this expression, the common destination of goods, means. It's anti-capitalist and pro-socialism or globalism. I read from section 173 of the compendium of Catholic social doctrine. If it is true that everyone is born with the right to use the goods of the earth, it is likewise true that in order to ensure that this right is exercised in an equitable and orderly fashion, regulated interventions are necessary. Interventions that are the result of national and international agreements and a juridical order that adjudicates and specifies the exercise of this right. In other words, you have to have an authority that tells you how you use your goods and who uses your goods. In another place in the compendium, this uh, is section 177, we find this quotation. And this is amazing. Very socialist. Practically communist. Now don't miss this afternoon because I'm going to go back and I'm going to talk about how the Roman Catholic Papacy has changed its emphasis and why. It used to emphasize the authority of the papal chair. It used to emphasize uh, the importance of the doctrines or the dogmas of the church. Now neither one of those things are central to Roman Catholicism. Now it is everything that we are talking about and there's agenda behind it. Notice this statement official Roman Catholic teaching. Christian tradition has never recognized the right to private property as absolute and untouchable. Did you catch that? That's communism. Christian tradition has never recognized the right to private property as absolute and untouchable. On the contrary, it has always understood this right, that is to private property, within the broader context of the right common to all to use the goods of the whole creation. The right to private property is subordinated to the right to common use, the fact that goods are meant for everyone. Section 179. New technological and scientific knowledge must be placed at the service of mankind's primary needs, gradually increasing humanity's, humanity's common patrimony. Putting the principle of the universal destination of goods into full effect, what needs to happen in order to put uh, the principle of the universal destination of goods into full effect? Here's the explanation therefore requires action at the international level, has to be global in other words, and planned programs on the part of all countries. In the encyclical Laudato Si, paragraph 93, every Adventist should read the encyclical by the Pope on the environment. There's a lot of good things in it, but it's truth mixed with error. And the agenda behind it is a socialist agenda, agenda. In paragraph 93, the Pope wrote in his encyclical, the principle of the subordination of private property to the universal destination of goods, and thus the right 
of everyone to their use is a golden rule of social conduct and the first principle of the whole ethical and social order. The Christ, this is the Pope writing now. The Christian tradition has never recognized the right to private property as absolute and inviolable and has stressed the social purpose of all forms of private property. In other words, private property is not private. What you have belongs to everyone. That's the reason why, I don't know if you've been keeping in touch with what has been happening in Chile. You know, one of the problems we have in the U.S. is we don't get any news. Except impeachment. From morning to night to midnight, impeachment, impeachment. And it's all just basically opinion. But we get no international news. Americans don't know what's happening on a global scale. It's not like other countries. My wife, you know, we have a couple of uh, Colombian channels that we get in our home. There's lots of international news about what's happening all over the world. You don't find that in the U.S. In Chile, there has been a tremendous uprising against the government, against the capitalist government. Chile was one of the most prosperous countries in all of Latin America. And for those of you who have been watching, multitudes simply ransacked stores, looted stores. What did the Pope have to say about the populace going into stores, stealing everything from the stores? What did he have to say? Nothing. In Venezuela, communist government, socialist government, the government has, has basically expropriated all kinds of private property, taken it over for the government. What has the Pope had to say about this? Absolutely nothing. Because the papal view is that pi private property is not private. It is there for the global good for everyone. Which means that if you have something that somebody else thinks that they need, they can take it. Is that the kind of world that you want to live in? A globalist, socialist world? Not me. Now let's notice a few statements where the papacy uses these specific expressions that I've mentioned. Let's begin with Benedict the 16th. In 2019 he wrote an encyclical called Caritas in Veritate, that means charity in truth. Listen carefully to what he wrote in that particular uh, encyclical. This is paragraph 67. It clearly shows what the papacy has in mind. He mentions seven things at the beginning of this paragraph. To manage the global economy. To revive economies hit by the crisis. The cri this was the crisis of 2008. To avoid any deterioration of the present crisis and the greater imbalances that would result. To bring about integral and timely disarmament. Five, food security and peace. Six, to guarantee the protection of the environment. Seven, to regulate migration. Are you noticing what the agenda is? To manage the global economy, to revive economies hit by the crisis, to avoid further decree, uh, deterioration of the present crisis, to fight for disarmament, for food security and peace, to protect the environment, and to regulate migration. What is needed according to Pope Benedict? For all this, he says, there is an urgent need of a true world political authority. What is needed to implement all these things? A what? A true world political authority. As my predecessor, blessed John the 23rd, indicated some years ago. Listen carefully now. Such an authority would need to be regulated by law. To how many countries would that law apply? Every country, because it's a world political authority. Such an authority would need to be regulated by law 
to, now listen carefully, to observe consistently the principles of subsidiarity and solidarity. To seek to establish the common good. Do you see the terms there? To seek to establish the common good. And to make a commitment to securing authentic integral human development inspired by the values of charity in truth. Now listen carefully. Furthermore, such an authority, what kind of authority is it? A world political authority. Such an authority would need to be universally recognized and to be vested with effective power to ensure security for all, regard for justice, and respect for rights. Obviously, it would have to have the authority to ensure compliance with its decisions from all parties and also with the coordinated measures adopted in various international forums. I'm not reading from the enemies of the papacy, I'm reading statements from the papacy itself. Their objectives. Paragraph 173 of the compendium states this, if it is true that everyone is born with the right to use the goods of the earth, it is likewise true that in order to ensure that this right is exercised in an equitable and orderly fashion, regulated interventions are necessary. Interventions that are the result of national and international agreements. And a juridical order, what does a juridical order mean? Those, it's, it's the judicial branch that enforces the law and so uh, a juridical order that adjudicates and specifies the exercise of this right. Now the question is to which authority was Benedict XVI referring to? When he says that there needs to be a global authority they can make sure that everybody cooperates and whoever doesn't, there need to be measures, juridical measures taken against them. To what authority was he referring? Well, there was a previous pope that explained. This is Pope Pius XI in an encyclical titled Quadragesimo Anno, he wrote the following. Speaking about uh, another pope, Leo XIII, he stated, that principle which Leo XIII so clearly established must be laid down at the outset here. Namely, that there resides in us. The word us, the you, is capitalized. When the papacy uses the word us with a capital U, it means the popes. So what is he saying? He's saying, it resides in us the popes, the right and duty to pronounce with supreme authority upon social and economic matters. With whom does it rest to pronounce with supreme authority on social and economic matters? What would the global authority be? It would be the papacy. In 1967, a journalist and also a Hollywood copyright philosopher, Ayn Rand, wrote the following words. She almost sounds like an Adventist here. She could already discern what the papal objectives are. I read, this is from the book Ecclesiastical Megalomania, page 195. The Catholic Church has never given up the hope to reestablish, what does reestablish mean? Folks, you cannot reestablish something that is already established. So at some point, this system must have lost its establishment. The Catholic Church has never given up the hope to reestablish the medieval union of church and state with a global state and a global theocracy as its ultimate goal. The Roman church state that's an, another expression that explains what the word papacy means. The, glo the Roman church state is a hybrid, a monster of ecclesiastical and political power. Its political thought is totalitarian. 
And whenever it has had the opportunity to apply its principles, the result has been bloody repression. If, during the last 30 years, remember she's writing in 1967, if in the last 30 years, the papacy has softened its assertions of full, supreme, and irresponsible power, and has murdered fewer people than before, such changes in behavior are not due to a change in its ideas, but to a change in its circumstances. Because it has a deadly wound. And then she writes this. This is the part that sounds almost Adventist. The Roman church state in the 20th century, however, is an institution recovering from a mortal wound. She probably never read Revelation 13. Extremely secular person. And she's saying, the Roman church state in the 20th century, however, is an institution recovering from a mortal wound. And then she writes, if and when, we can get rid of the if as Adventists, but she writes, if and when, it regains, what does regain mean? It cannot regain what it didn't what? What it didn't lose. If and when it regains its full power and authority, it will impose a regime more sinister than any the planet has yet seen. Was she on target? She was very much on target. So what is the agenda of the papacy with regards to the nations of the world? By the way, is the United Nations a socialist organization? Every time the United States proposes something, a capitalist country, the nations of the world, with one or two exceptions, Israel, a few others, they are vetoed. Because the United Nations is a socialist, a globalist organization. Most of the nations that belong to the United Nations are in favor of globalism or socialism. The same agenda that the papacy has. See, the papacy has changed its emphasis, has changed its talking points, so that it is palatable with the globalist powers of the world, so that then they will feel confident in giving their support to the papacy once more. But as we noticed in our study last night, the papacy has a second priority. You see, there's another enemy that came up in antithesis to the papacy. And what was that other enemy? Not only the socialist powers of the world, but Protestantism. Was Protestantism an antithetical movement against the papacy? You better believe it. So somehow the papacy has to win over Protestantism. Not only the secular world, not only the globalist powers of the world, not only the socialist communist powers of the world, but the papacy somehow has to gain the support of Protestants again. Ellen White wrote in Great Controversy, page 566, Protestants have tampered with and patronized popery. The word popery is a, <laughs> a word for papacy. It's a word from the times of Ellen White refers to the papacy. She says, Protestants have tampered with and patronized popery. They, that is Protestants, have made compromises and concessions. Compromises and concessions to whom? To the papacy. Which papists themselves are surprised to see and fail to understand. In other words, the papacy is saying, this is too good to be true. Protestants are okay with us. She continues, men are closing their eyes to the real character of Romanism and the dangers to be apprehended from her supremacy. And then she gives this counsel. The people need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. Is the papacy a dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty? Is that the way the media sees the papacy? Is that the way that the political rulers of the world see the papacy? 
Is that the way that Protestants are seeing the papacy? No. This is a good system that cares for the poor and wants open borders to allow immigra free immigration, etc. If Protestantism stood on the firm platform of Bible truth, it could never synthesize with the papacy. The freedoms that we enjoy today in American society are due to the spirit of Protestantism. These include freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of enterprise, freedom of conscience, and freedom of religion. All of these come from Protestantism. How is it that Protestants then could ever join a system that is antithetical to the values of Protestantism? The first is by embracing liberal ideas. Allow me to read you this statement from Ellen White, Review and Herald, June 1, 1886. She's criticizing Protestants, even back there in 1886. And this, Catholicism, is the religion that Protestants are beginning to look upon with so much favor and which will eventually be united with Protestantism. This union will not take place, however, by a change in Catholicism. Now, Catholicism changes its face. It gets a facelift. But beneath the facelift and all the jewelry it puts on and all the makeup, it's the same ugly system in its substance or in its essence. I'm not talking about individual Roman Catholics. Most of God's true people are in the Roman Catholic communion. They just don't know anything about this. So she states, this union, or synthesis, however, will not take place by a change in Catholicism. For Rome never changes. She claims infallibility. So then what's going to happen? Listen, Protestants will change. Protestantism will change. So who's going to do the changing? Protestantism is going to do the changing. And now listen to this. The adoption of liberal ideas on its part. The adoption of liberal ideas by Protestantism will bring it where it can clasp the hand of Catholicism. How is it that Protestantism is going to embrace and, you know, hug Roman Catholicism? By the adoption of what? Liberal ideas. Now what could that expression, liberal ideas, mean? Well, we have to apply to Ellen White the same principles that we apply to the study of Scripture. Scripture explains Scripture. When you find an expression in one part of the Bible, you go to other parts of the Bible that use the same expression in order to have a fuller view. We do the same with Ellen White. So if she speaks of liberal ideas, we need to go to other places in her writings that would explain what liberal ideas mean. Now Ellen White uses the, liberal, the word liberal in primarily three different ways. The first way is that she says that Seventh-day Adventists should be liberal. She's not speaking about us being liberal in our theology, but we should be liberal in our tithes and offerings. So in that sense, she uses the word liberal in a positive sense. She wrote, for example, Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1103. A responsibility rests upon the ministers of Christ to educate the churches to be liberal. So Ellen White says, our ministers should educate our members to be liberal. Not theologically liberal, but liberal in their giving. Ellen White also uses the word liberal in a positive sense when she speaks about the principles upon which the United States was built. Things like the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. In Great Controversy, she wrote on page 442, speaking about the beast that rises from the earth, the lamb-like horns and the dragon voice 
of the symbol point to a striking contradiction between the professions and the practice of the nation thus represented. The speaking of the nation is the action of its legislative and judicial authorities. By such action, it will give the lie to those liberal and peaceful principles which it has put forth as the foundation of her policy. So the United States was built upon liberal and peaceful principles. The word liberal is used positively. Now I looked up in the uh, Webster's Dictionary of 1828 of the times of Ellen White what the word liberal means in this sense. It means generous, free, and open. Are the principles of the United States generous, free, and open? Yes, in that sense liberal is good. However, Ellen White also uses the word liberal in a negative sense. Let me just read you a couple of statements. Ministry of Healing, page 129. The progress of reform depends upon a clear recognition of fundamental truth. So fundamental truth is essential. Then she writes, while on the one hand danger lurks in a narrow philosophy and a hard cold orthodoxy so one side of the equation one extreme is hard cold orthodoxy in other words bare doctrine arid doctrine orthodox doctrine that's one extreme then she warns on the other hand there is great danger in careless liberalism so on one side is hard, cold orthodoxy. The emphasis is only on doctrine. On the other side is careless liberalism. Which means basically we can be flexible in our views, our theological views. In volume 20 of Manuscript Releases, page 71, she wrote, Sinners are continually crying, You are too narrow, so narrow. Liberalism, cry the lawless. What do the lawless cry out? Liberalism. Cry the lawless. Bring not your claims of the law upon us. The religion of Christ, says another, is too hard. I cannot be a Christian. It involves too much. So what does liberal mean in the negative sense in the writings of Ellen White? Basically it means that we need to have theological flexibility. Not emphasis on doctrine, but just allow everybody to have a big tent to allow everybody to believe whatever they want to believe. Full diversity, inclusiveness, pluralism, without regard for Bible principles and doctrines. It also includes accommodating the biblical view of creation to the evolutionary theory, which we'll talk about this afternoon. So the first way in which Protestants are going to embrace Catholicism is by adopting what? Liberal ideas, inclusiveness, pluralism, etc. There's another way in which Protestantism is going to merge with the papacy. Ellen White in Great Controversy, page 571, wrote this. As the Protestant churches have been seeking the favor of the world, what have Protestant churches been doing? seeking the favor of the world, all you have to do is turn on your television on a Sunday morning to watch uh, the great preachers of the land, the mega preachers of the land. You know, they're preaching things with which the world is pretty much comfortable. No ruffling of feathers. So notice, as the Protestant churches have been seeking the favor of the world, listen carefully now, False charity has blinded their eyes. What has blinded the eyes of Protestants as they've been seeking the favor of the world? In a, what does it mean that, you, that Protestantism is seeking the favor of the world? They want the world to what? To like them. Yeah. To feel comfortable with them. So as the Protestant churches have been seeking the favor of the world, false charity has blinded their eyes. Let's, let me ask you, if there's false charity, there has to be what? True charity. She continues. They do not see, but that it is right to believe good of all evil. What would be believe good of all evil? 
How about saying gay marriage is okay? Gay clergy is all right. Abortion is fine. A prosperity gospel is all right. Euthanasia is okay. You know, don't, don't press those points because the world's not going to like you. Let's adapt to the world. So they do not see but that it is right to believe good of all evil. And as an inevitable result, they will finally believe evil of all good. Let me read you a few other statements where Ellen White uses the expression false charity and true charity. This is in uh, an appeal to our ministers and conference committees written in 1892. Bible charity is not sentimentalism. Do you know what sentimentalism is? Oh, let's just all get along, folks. Let's just feel good about one another. Forget doctrine. That's hard, arid. Let's just hug each other and embrace each other. Let everybody believe what they want. Once again, Bible charity is not sentimentalism, but love in active exercise. To heal the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace, is called charity. What is called charity? Peace, peace, all's fine. She continues, to confederate together, that's ecumenism, to confederate together, to call sin, holiness, and truth, is called charity. So to confederate together, to all join together, in our diversity, and to, to call sin, holiness, and truth, is called charity. But then she writes, but it is the counterfeit article. What is the counterfeit article? Confederating together and fell in to call sin and holiness and truth by its right name. She continues, those who would cover evil under false charity. Ah, so now we know what false charity is. Those who would cover evil under false charity say to the sinner, it shall be well with thee. Charity hates the sin, but loves the sinner, and will warn him faithfully of his danger, pointing him to the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. What is this again? Charity hates the sin, but loves the sinner, and will warn him faithfully of his danger, pointing him to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Prophets and Kings, page 675, A. Ellen White wrote, In the work of reform to be carried forward today, there is need of men who, like Ezra and Nehemiah, will not palliate or excuse sin, nor shrink from vindicating the honor of God. Those upon whom rests the burden of this work will not hold their peace when wrong is done. Neither will they cover evil with a cloak of false charity. So what has Protestantism done? They have false charity. They want the world to like them. And of course, when you rebuke sin, what happens? There's an opposite reaction. One more quotation, Acts of the Apostles, page 554. You must have charity, is the cry heard everywhere, especially from those who profess sanctification. However, true charity is too pure to cover an unconfessed sin. While we are to love souls for whom Christ died, we are to make no compromise with evil. We are not to unite with the rebellious and call this charity. God requires His people in this age of the world to stand for the right. And unflinching, as unflinchingly as did John the Apostle in opposition to soul-destroying errors. Quite explicit, isn't it? 
But there's a third way in which Protestantism will merge with the papacy. And that is coming together on common points of doctrine. Let me just read you a couple of statements from the writings of Ellen White. Great Controversy 444. The wide diversity of belief in the Protestant churches is regarded by many as decisive proof that no effort to secure a forced uniformity can ever be made. However, there has been for years in the churches of the Protestant faith a strong and growing sentiment in favor listen carefully now in favor of a union based upon common points of doctrine. Now what has to happen in order to unite on common points of doctrine? She explains, to secure such a union, the discussion of subjects upon which all were not agreed, however important they might be from a Bible standpoint, might, must necessarily be waived. In other words, talk about only the points that unite us, not the points that divide us. Page 445, the very next page, Ellen White wrote, when the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions. Then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. So what are the doctrines that Protestants, most Protestant churches have in common with the papacy? Do you think that they're going to argue over infant baptism? No, that's too controversial. How about confessing your sins to a priest? Too controversial. How about the idea that in communion you're actually eating the body and the blood of Christ? Too controversial. There are two doctrines that the papacy and Protestants have in common. And those two doctrines are the sanctity of Sunday and the immortality of the soul. And Ellen White has written that upon these two doctrines, which Protestants and Catholics have in common, the union will come. And by the way, Protestants separated from the papacy. The papacy refers to this, to the Protestants, as the daughters, the alienated daughters. But unfortunately, the daughters, when they left the mother, did not leave everything relating to the mother. And so she will come back, Protestantism will come back to the mother. Now, much of Protestantism today has forsaken the Bible as the absolute standard of truth. And Protestantism has become liberal, politically correct, redefining truth and error in the light of tradition and not the scriptures. What the papacy did during the 1260 years by forbidding the Bible Today it does by undermining the authority of the Bible. Let me just read you a couple of statements from Ellen White. These are long statements, but they, they compare what the papacy did with the Bible during the 1260 years and what is happening today. Our authority is in this book. If our authority is culture, feelings, emotion, tradition, or any of those standards, were sunk. We must stand by this word. Notice what she wrote about the papacy forbidding the Bible during the 1260 years. It kept people in ignorance. Great Controversy, page 51. Satan well knew that the Holy Scriptures would enable men to discern his deceptions and withstand his power. It was by the word that even the Savior of the world had resisted his attacks. Every, at every assault, Christ presented the shield of eternal truth, saying, It is written. To every suggestion of the adversary, he opposed the wisdom and power of the word. In order for Satan to maintain his sway over men, 
and establish the authority of the papal usurper, he must keep them in ignorance of the scriptures. The Bible would exalt God and place finite men in their true position. Therefore, the sacred truths of the Bible must be concealed and suppressed. The Roman Church adopted this logic. For hundreds of years the circulation of the Bible was prohibited. The people were forbidden to read it or to have copies in their homes. And unprincipled priests and prelates interpreted its teachings to sustain their pretensions. Thus the Pope came almost universally to be acknowledged as the vicegerent of God on earth, endowed with authority over church and state, the detector of error having been removed, Satan worked according to his will. Are you catching the picture? By forbidding the Bible? It is the way that Satan could deceive people because the people had no way of discerning his counterfeit or his deceptions because the Bible unmasks his deceptions. Now, can the devil today forbid the reading of the Bible? No! We live in the age of the internet. People have so many different versions of the Bible. The papacy could never say, you can't have a Bible. You know, there's this view that during the time of trouble we better memorize scripture because the Bibles will be forbidden. That's not, the, that's not the devil's method at the end of time. At the end of time, the devil will do what he did by forbidding the Bible. He will do it by undermining the authority of the Bible. And this is where I bring the second statement. Great Controversy 572. Listen carefully. A day of great intellectual darkness has been shown to be favorable to the success of the papacy. What was the success of the papacy? A great, what? A day of great intellectual darkness. Why intellectual darkness? Because the Bible is light. Thy word is a light and a lamp. So where the light and the lamp isn't, there is what? Darkness. So a day of great intellectual darkness has been shown to be favorable to the success of the papacy. It will yet be demonstrated that a, great, that a day of great intellectual light is equally favorable for its success. In past ages, now she explains how it's going to happen, in past ages when men were without God's word and without the knowledge of the truth, their eyes were blindfolded and thousands were ensnared not seeing the net spread for their feet. In this generation there are many whose eyes become dazzled by the glare of human speculations. Science falsely so called. They discern not the net and walk into it as readily as if blindfolded. God designed that man's intellectual powers should be held as a gift from his maker and should be employed in the service of truth and righteousness. But when pride and ambition are cherished and men exalt their own theories above the Word of God, then intelligence can accomplish greater harm than ignorance. Powerful statement. Thus, the false science of the present day, listen carefully, thus the false science of the present day which undermines faith in the Bible will prove as successful in preparing the way for the acceptance of the papacy with its pleasing forms as did the withholding of knowledge in, the opening, in opening the way for its aggrandizement in the dark ages. So it's the same to forbid the Bible as to undermine its authority. Because human beings consider themselves more intelligent than the Bible. We're going to notice this afternoon, for example, the papacy has fully embraced the theory of evolution. Pope Francis has said that the story in Genesis of the creation is a symbolic story. That the universe came into existence by a big bang 13.8 billion years ago. Because who's going to believe that God has enough power 
to speak things into existence for six days in a world of sophistication like we know today. Now, one statement, actually two statements, as we close this morning. This afternoon we're going to uh, delve more into how the papacy has changed its talking points and why. Ellen White wrote in Great Controversy 565 and 566, the Protestant churches are in great darkness. Protestant churches are what? This is in her day. Are in great darkness. Or they would discern the signs of the times. The Roman church is far reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She is employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world, to reestablish persecution, and to undo all that Protestantism has done. Catholicism is gaining ground upon every side. See the increasing number of her churches and chapels in Protestant countries. Look at the popularity of her college and seminaries in America, so widely patronized by Protestants. Look at the growth of ritualism in England and the frequent defections to the ranks of the Catholics. These things should awaken the anxiety of all who prize the pure principles of the gospel. I want to mention one further thing and then read a closing short statement from the writings of Ellen White. The reason why Protestantism no longer fears the papacy and does not discern how the papacy is attempting to destroy Protestantism and to win over the support of the socialist globalist powers of the world is because Protestantism has forgotten its prophetic roots. You see the reformers had no doubts that the papacy was the antichrist of scripture. So they would have never united with the papacy because they studied prophecy and prophecy told them that the, the little horn, the man of sin, the heart of Revelation 17 represents the papacy. But two Roman Catholic scholars, one by the name of Luis de Alcázar, right after the Protestant Reformation, during the Counter-Reformation, established a way of interpreting prophecy which is known as preterism. It's the idea that the Antichrist prophecies were fulfilled in the past with a nasty individual called Antiochus Epiphanes who lived in 165 years before Christ and the prophecies about the beast in Revelation were fulfilled with the Roman emperors that Nero was the beast of Revelation 13. Liberal Protestant churches have embraced preterism. Liberal Protestant churches are usually have the word united with them. <laughs> united Methodist, United Presbyterian, United Lutheran, United Church of Christ. Those are the liberal wing of Protestantism. They are preterists. They believe that the Antichrist prophecies were fulfilled with Antiochus Epiphanes, the early Roman emperors, and that the beast of Revelation 13 was Nero. So it's just history. Conservative Protestants like Pentecostals and Evangelicals, embrace another method that was established by another Roman Catholic scholar by the name of Francisco Rivera. He established futurism. It's the idea that the Antichrist prophecies have not been fulfilled yet. That at the very end of time, a nasty individual is going to arise who is the Antichrist. He will blaspheme the God of heaven. He will rebuild the Jerusalem temple. By the way, this will all happen after the rapture of the church. He will rebuild the Jewish temple. He will favor the Jews for three and a half years. Then, in the middle of the last week, he'll turn against the Jews. He'll build a gigantic image of himself, command everybody to worship that image, and he will tattoo people on their foreheads or on their hand. Now who is that going to deceive? No one. And so Satan has been successful in getting Protestantism to look to the past for the fulfillment of Antichrist prophecies or to look to the future after the church has gone to heaven in the rapture for the fulfillment of prophecy. And meanwhile, in Rome and in the United States, 
prophecies being fulfilled and they can't see it because they're looking in the wrong place. Protestantism has forgotten its roots. The Adventist Church is the last hope. It is the last historicist church in the world today. It is the church that has not forsaken its prophetic principles. The principle of historicism. That prophecy was fulfilled, some of them, is being fulfilled, and soon will culminate with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let us never forsake folk, folks our roots. Let us never be embarrassed about our origins. The Adventist church was born from a great disappointment. Some people are embarrassed about that. Well, why should we be embarrassed? The whole Christian church originated with a great disappointment. They expected Jesus to establish his earthly kingdom. And their hopes were dashed. But then they studied prophecy and said, Oh no, he was going to die and resurrect and go to intercede in heaven. Now we understand. Well, after 1844, the Adventist church studied further. They discovered that instead of Jesus establishing his kingdom on earth, he entered a new phase of his ministry in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So if you're embarrassed about the origins of the Adventist church, you would certainly be embarrassed about the origins of the, of the Christian church. Are you with me? It's time, folks, that we get back to our roots and preach what we should be preaching, present truth. The world needs to know these things. People's hearts are failing them for fear because they see what's happening in the world. They can't explain it. They can't get a good night's sleep. They say, where is this all leading to? We know. We have the message. And I don't say that arrogantly. We have the message that can bring peace. Jesus said, in the world you'll have tribulation. But I've overcome the world. Let me read you one closing statement, the short one. I read this one last night. Speaking about the papacy, the papacy changes its face but it does not change its substance. You've all heard the story of the frog and the scorpion, right? You all know that story? Is there anybody that's never heard the story of the frog and the scorpion? Well, there's two or three. <laughs> Can I tell you the story? There was a frog and a scorpion on the edge of a river. And the frog can swim, but the scorpion can't. So the scorpion says to the frog, Hey, I need to go to the other side of the river. Can I climb on your back and you can swim across so I can get across the river? Thus, and the frog says, Yeah, right. You get on my back, you'll sting me, and I'll die. And the scorpion said, I would never do that. If I did that, we would both die. Let me, please let me, get, let me get on your back so I can cross the river. No, 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 no. The frog says, I know you're going to sting me, and I'm going to die. And the scorpion once again says, no, 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 you're not going to die. Because why would I sting you? I would drown too. So finally the frog is persuaded, and he allows the scorpion to get on his back. He starts swimming across the river, and when he gets to the middle of the river, whoosh, the scorpion stings the frog. And as the frog is at the point of death, he says to the scorpion, you promised, you told me that you were not going to sting me, and now I'm going to die. Why did you do this? And the scorpion said, because it's my nature. Did you catch the point? Ellen White wrote, Great Controversy 571, it is part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. See, she used to attack Protestantism, she used to attack Communism or Socialism. Now, now the world has changed, so she needs to change too. Not what she is, but her look. It is part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. But beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, you know what a chameleon is? 
It's a lizard that changes colors according to the environment where the lizard is found. Camouflage. But beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. So this afternoon we will continue under the title Francis the Socialist. We're going to see that there is war in the Roman Catholic Church right now. The, pap the, the Jesuits have declared war on the papacy. The Jesuits are the ones that have led the Catholic Church to change its talking points in order to overcome Protestantism and in order to get the global power powers to unite with the papacy. So don't miss the next exciting episode. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the sure word of prophecy. We thank you for the spirit of prophecy, which helps us understand in a more ample way the prophecies that we find in Scripture. Lord, I ask that you will help us to realize the times that we're living in, that we will be excited about your message, that we will share it far and wide, for the world needs to know these things so that people can make wise decisions to be on the right side in the final controversy. I ask that you will continue to bless us as we study this afternoon. You'll give us a wonderful time together at lunch. And we thank you, Lord, for having been with us in this meeting. In this we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.